indicators of climate change in terms of global warming. Uh, many are shown here and they have a, a role to play in sea level. Certainly uh, water vapor in the going into the atmosphere, water vapor um, can contribute to um, the, the blanket greenhouse warming. Uh, the temperature of the air over the oceans can transfer heat to the ocean. When you add heat to a liquid, the volume will increase. And uh, so hence we have sea level rise as a result of thermal expansion. Um, and increased ocean heat content. Uh, a lot of the carbon uh, dioxide that we are releasing in the atmosphere is being taken up by the ocean, in fact, uh, most of that. And so that is also leading to another factor called ocean acidification. Uh, with warming, you start to begin see seeing feedbacks. Uh, a warmer ocean may create a warmer coastal, coastal area, which may also reduce uh, glacier ice mass and snow cover which can also increase heat, which can also reduce ice cover. And when the ice melts, it goes into the fluvial hydrologic system and into the ocean. Um, loss of sea ice would be another indicator as we're seeing uh, much, much vastly reduced sea ice in the Arctic Ocean and uh, north of Labrador. And then uh, ice having a high albedo, it could reflect solar radiation back to space. Um, snow also as well, but uh, the ocean not so much. So we can enter a positive feedback loop. Um, our understanding of sea level has increased dramatically in a century. Uh, here you see a, com a rather complicated graphic, but it shows the main drivers, just like the other cartoon, but it also has these little plus signs and arrows to show sort of the time scale on which they're operating. So. I'll show, uh, add to that conversation uh, or slide before, groundwater. So uh, groundwater, we, um, we know it's being pumped and some of our aquifers are then being um, basically depleted. But when it pumps out on the surface, it either evaporates or runs off. Very little of the groundwater pumping uh, ends up back in the, into the water table, even though we are trying to figure out ways to treat uh, water and put it back in the aquifers. But huge aquifers have been depleted and that takes tens of thousands of years for some of those aquifers to accumulate. That's a small contributor to sea level rise, but it is one. Um, we have started to see a lot of basal melt of ice shelves shown here on the right. And that then also, uh, you know, affecting the friction uh, that holds some of these ice shelves in place. If we see rapid calving, uh, breaking off of these large ice shelves, such as in West Antarctic ice sheet, uh, then we could see uh, rather dramatic upticks in the rate of sea level rise. Uh, we, that's been a point of a lot of study by NASA and other uh, space agencies. Uh, there's a GRACE satellite in particular that's been tracking this. I've worked with uh, researchers who uh, fly over Greenland and uh, look for uh, the changing volume of the ice sheet using LIDAR, and we do uh, GIS analysis with that same sensor, same plane even. Uh, so since uh, this has been an object of study, we've documented, you know, some pretty rapid in decreases in ice mass in Greenland. We've seen some increases in calving of glaciers, the Piedmont glaciers off of Greenland. We've seen increases in water temperatures underneath the ice. Uh, sheets uh, of some of the Piedmont glaciers coming off of Greenland too. And Antarctica has also lost some ice. And uh, a few of the large, uh, like ice, Larson ice shelf have uh, been depleted. But we've sort of been seeing an uptick in the contribution of these to uh, sea level rise. Um, this really uh, was a key cornerstone of this uh, global warming debate early on and even up till fairly recently. Are humans a causing factor or is this entirely natural cycle? So now uh, the debate is pretty much over and uh, humans have been able, we've been able to tease that apart. It's not Milankovitch cycles, it's not sunspots, it's not natural inherent variability of the climate. It's the addition of greenhouse gas emissions by humans since the industrial revolution combined with all these other uh, processes I've just mentioned uh, increased runoff, groundwater pumping, uh, and so on. Even uh, 
pumping the, the groundwater can lead to increased subsidence. The crust can uh, subside. So you have a drop in vertical land motion when you remove the water essentially from an aquifer, but or as well as gas and oil. Uh, another big factor here is the impact of this on the thermohaline circulation, uh, which I won't go into super detail about, but you know, this is a, a global uh, conveyor belt system and it starts basically in Antarctica and then it create, produces a, a salinity and temperature driven current, uh, thermohaline circulation. And smaller currents are sort of contributors and uh, spin-offs to this, uh, a wide variety of them. The Gulf Stream is one. So the Gulf Stream has been slowing down somewhat. We have seen an increase in water flowing from the north, uh, the Labrador Current, uh, perhaps contributed by the changes in Greenland, uh, the melting, melting out. And there's some, uh, you know, concerns that this could then slow down the thermohaline circulation. And then that could lead to uh, even rapid changes in climate. Um, another factor we have documented is thinning and lateral reduction of sea ice cover. So here's some uh, documentation of that. Uh, polar bears have been a big concern uh, because they use the ice for hunting. It is essentially a key habitat for them. And uh, without that, they are, are forced into a much more marginalized uh, you know, survival situation. I'll play this little video of the ice albedo feedback system as an example of this. And what you're seeing here, if you watch this uh, glacier, is the sunlight slowly increasing the temperature of the ocean which increases the melting of the ice, which increases the area exposed to direct sunlight, which increases the insulation and creation of heat. So this would be a positive feedback loop. Uh, some have even used the term uh, runaway greenhouse effect. So here's another graph showing decline in uh, Arctic sea ice extent, and then future declines also with, you know, capturing this uh, feedback mechanism. And uh, I won't go into the details of each of those RCPs, but uh, the shallower of them is more of the, the green, is more of we jump in and we sort of uh, mitigate climate change. We sort of stop putting greenhouse gas emissions out. We go back to our slow turn back to year 2000 level of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere and it, it will take, you know, not just decades, but millennia to actually try to turn that around. Rising temperatures uh, in the Arctic, the higher latitudes are seeing uh, the greater uh, acceleration with uh, climate changes. And uh, so that goes hand in hand with this ice albedo feedback. But, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing that influence uh, the climate locally in the coasts and the near or near shore ocean uh, all around the Arctic. Uh, the uh, Northwest Passage through uh, the Arctic, Canada, United States, uh, kind of this uh, side of the Arctic Ocean has uh, be become tenable now to begin uh, with some icebreaker operation assistance that we have a whole new uh, Northwest Passage. <laughs> for uh, international trade and commerce. And that has led to really global uh, strategic concerns about uh, who then owns the Arctic Ocean, uh, who's gonna maintain uh, the security there and uh, respond to events, so oil spills, military uh, flashpoints. Canada has even uh, launched a series of military training exercises, what they call so sovereignty exercises to exercise their, uh, their claim to that area. And Russia, even the United States have uh, had quibbles with this. Other evidence of warming, breakdown of uh, ice free, the year, the date of the river ice melting out and uh, 
northern climates. So this is done in Alaska. I believe you can play a lottery to pick the hour that uh, the Tana uh, River breaks free uh, north of Anchorage. But uh, in um, Finland, there's a river. They actually bottle beer, Lapin Kolka, in the northern part of Finland near Lapland. And we've seen steadily uh, a, you know, a warming trend. How do they go back to 1690? Because they've been keeping tax records of this area. And in the tax records, uh, they would record that. Uh, another look at uh, climate graph, you know, kind of the hockey stick to hell, some people have called it, uh, Stephen Colbert. But we see the records needing to be studied to uh, make these inferences predictions. So if we can hindcast or historically simulate climate, then we can have even more confidence or reduced uncertainty in which track we're on going in the future. And then we can plan accordingly. We can uh, uh, mitigate the impact of climate change or we can adapt to it. Uh, we just, we have to know we have still a high degree of uncertainty uh, as a result, but we have used proxy records. We've used landforms. We've used tide gauges since the late uh, 18th century. Uh, Sewell's Point is the best gauge that we have in the Hampton Roads tidewater area. And then in the last decade or two, we've started to use satellite data, satellite altimetry to actually physically measure the height of the ocean globally. And then we use computer models if that can historically simulate these accurately, we take those forward and uh, then we have a better confidence in their predictions. And in a nutshell, um, year to year, we have a lot of noise in these data. We have a lot of other processes affecting uh, both globally and regionally uh, what is happening. We have oscillations like El Nino and Southern Oscillation. Uh, we have changes in the Rossby waves uh, they go around and the subtropical jet that go around the northern hemisphere that can have influences on this. But uh, we are now able to increasingly even uh, account for those short term variations. And uh, here you see the model kind of predictions and then the, and the measurements from the satellite all lining up to be within very close to the computer model predictions. Um, so that's very confidence boosting uh, that basically our, our ability to simulate sea level rise is reducing the uncertainty. Uh, and of course, among these contributors to sea level rise, this recent paper, actually um, OD Professor Sanki Dungendorf is uh, an author on this, has uh, made a huge difference in basically teasing apart those contrib contributions, the glacier contribution, the terrestrial water, contribution and the thermal expansion, and then seeing how they play a role in uh, the recent historical to recent uh, changes in sea level.